In order to understand how markets work, we first need some core terminology, some key concepts and, and sort of big economic ideas um, that we use to describe the phenomena and the models that we use uh, to, to understand how markets work. And to guide us through, if you want, these, um, this terminology, we have these four um, dudes on the, on the left. Now, as you surely will have noticed, they are all old, white, and mostly dead dudes. Um, but I think that tells you more about the time during which those, those discoveries uh, were made and the kinds of societies um, these, these people lived in uh, at the time. And I hope it's not an indictment of, of modern economics, um, but I'm not sure. Um, so who do we have here? The guy on the top left with a shortage hipster beard uh, is Wilfredo Pareto. Pareto uh, was an Italian thinker economist and Wilfredo and I are gonna split some cookies in a few minutes. Um, who else do we have? Below Wilfredo, the guy with the glasses and the slightly sort of straining face um, is Friedrich von Hayek who wrote the, um, the, um, the paper on prices that you that you were forced to read um, and uh, sort of early 20th century thinker of course. Then um, next to Friedrich we have a photo of a statue of Adam Smith um, in Edinburgh that I took a few years ago. And Adam Smith, of course, is a sort of thinker of the Scottish Enlightenment and a, a um, father of modern economics, if you want. Um, and uh, in the top right corner, we have Joe Stiglitz. And Joe Stiglitz, of course, is the author of our textbook, a um, big critic of globalization, Nobel laureate, and the next few slides are basically based on uh, on what he wrote in the in the textbook. Um, so he will guide us through the next few slides. And if reading the book chapters hasn't put you off completely of Joe Stiglitz, um, he's also on Twitter, uh, and I would very much recommend you following him on on Twitter. It's um, it's it's very interesting what he has to say. Um, but what does he say in the book? Well, he says that all modern economies are mixed economies. Now, what does that mean, a mixed economy? Well, all economies basically have um, a free market, sort of private sector, capitalist kind of side where people engage voluntarily in exchange in, in market type interactions. And there's a public side, a government allocating resources or telling people what to do, or setting up markets, or forbidding markets, or um, you know engaging in, in 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 all sorts of activities, guaranteeing contracts, right? And so, in reality, all economies are mixed. Um, the the sort of extreme ideal point type utopian ends of this spectrum, and they don't really exist in the real world. So, what would the extreme endpoints of this this sort of state versus market scale look like well i guess on the on the market end it would be sort of this you know american libertarians kind of paradise of no government you know people out for you know for themselves uh, trading or not if they want or not um but in reality that sounds pretty you know jungly to me and not really like a free market more like a sort of robbing and, and stealing kind of environment. Um, so I don't think it really exists. Um, and on the other end, you have sort of the, the communist stream, huh? so the, the, the state guaranteeing everything, uh, producing everything, giving everyone to, you know, according to their need and to their, to their desires. Um, and even in a place like North Korea, um, which gets pretty close to the, to the idea of a purely sort of state-led um, environment, you will find markets, black markets for, for, for goods or, or probably food in the North Korean case. Okay, so all modern economies are mixed economies. And so you have the state on the one hand and you have markets on the other end. So what, what are the ingredients of markets? Well, um, at the center, we have profit maximizing firms and utility maximizing consumers in competitive markets. Now, what does that mean? So most economic activity, most production is not done by people individually. It's done 
um, collectively by groups of people, right? So by firms, uh, for example, um, you know, Apple is a big company. Huh? It, it, it has a sort of a leader. It has people that 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 actually produce the things. It has uh, management. You know, this is not a market uh, type interaction, of course, that they engage in. They are an organization uh, with 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 clear responsibilities and division of labor in, inside it. Um, so, and the, the whole goal of the operation is is not to make nice computers. It's of course to maximize profit, to make money. Okay, so profit maximizing firms are the core sort of production side um, uh, agents in, in modern economies. And on the other hand, we have consumers. And consumers are, you know, all of us. Uh, so we buy things, we don't buy things, um, we interact with each other, we interact with the, with the, with the firms and with the, with the government. And economics often assumes that consumers are utility maximizing. So now what does that mean, utility maximizing? Well, it basically means that we choose things that we want and don't choose things that we don't want. Um, and, you know, if you want to discuss in the seminars a more sort of uh, detailed definitions of this, um, you, you can, but I think we leave it at that for now. And they engage in competitive markets, at least in the ideal uh, scenario, uh, and we'll see many um, diversions from this. Um, so economics then is the study of how society allocates scarce resources. Right? So how, how does the interplay of profit maximizing firms utility maximizing consumers and the state result in an allocation of resources in society. And one of the core concepts then um, that we as people face as, as consumers or as potential workers in a, in a firm um, is that we face trade-offs. Huh? We, we can do one thing, but that usually means giving up something else. So as a simple example, you know, the fact that you're watching, um, watching this video and taking, taking this course you're, you're, you face the trade-off here. Yeah? You can watch me talk about markets for an hour, or you can watch an hour of cat videos. Mm. Now, I wouldn't recommend the cat videos, but we all know how nice sort of YouTube videos can be, of course. So it's a difficult choice maybe for some of you. Mm. But hopefully you've all made the choice to invest in your in your human resources if you want to invest in your in your education. Uh, but that comes at a cost of sort of delaying the immediate gratification you get from from uh, from watching cat videos or, or dancing on TikTok. Okay. Um, so that already kind of foreshadows the next con next concept, which is opportunity cost. So what's opportunity cost? Well, the opportunity cost of an item is what you give up to obtain that item. So in order to um, to uh, to get a Snickers bar, you shouldn't just think about, okay, the Snickers bar costs one, one pound. You should think about what else could you have bought with that one pound? Mm -hmm. Or thinking again about the, about, uh, you know, taking this class, you know, you, you, your your time is valuable, huh? So you could have spent the time on something else. That's the idea of opportunity cost, huh? So you shouldn't just think about I spent an hour watching videos about markets, but you should think, okay, what is uh, what is it that I could have done instead um, with my time? That's the true cost, um, of course. And I think that bites more if you think about sort of leisure activities. Huh? What's the true cost of watching another episode of? I don't know, uh, uh, Narcos on Mex on um, on uh, Netflix. Uh, well, it's it's not reading the, the the Hayek reading or not preparing for for exams or essays. Um, so that makes maybe some of the choices um, appear different uh, to you. So opportunity costs and so decisions require comparing costs and benefits of these of these alternatives. And we'll sort of go through a detailed example, of course, in the later parts of the lecture. Um, but I think generally we can always think of um, of ourselves as consumers, as, as, as workers, as sort of making decisions in terms of opportunity cost and making decisions uh, in terms of the costs and the benefits of, of different, different actions. Okay, and from that it also flows that people respond to incentives, of course. So changes in the costs or changes in the benefits um, motivate people to, to respond. Uh, so if you if the um, you know, if the value of the alternative uh, activity goes up, 
uh, then you, you're, you're more likely to choose that. Huh? Or if something becomes cheaper, you're perhaps more willing to choose. And if something becomes more expensive, you're less willing to choose it. And this idea of people making these kinds of decisions, um, you know, while this is theoretically very satisfying, of course, in reality, there are many deviations from it. People are kind of erratic, etc. But it's usually enough for us to assume that on average, most people respond to these things. So while, of course, we have sort of individual differences and people making crazy choices huh? overall if things get more expensive for example fewer people will buy it mm -hmm. and that that kind of level of cost benefit uh, analysis is, is is often sufficient for us so we don't need all to we don't we don't all need to be least like utility maximizing super smart homo economicus mr spock type people uh, in order to for the models to work. The models usually work if on average we act as if uh, we were making these decisions. Huh? So people just respond to these changes. Um, what happens then? So we have these firms, we have utility maximizing consumers. Um, and so so how do we do it? Well, we, we use economic models to, to describe these, these relationships. And you'll see one in a few minutes. And models often rely on the idea of equilibrium, so a steady state where um, nobody has an incentive to to move away from it. Huh? So once um, people offer a good at a certain price and other people are buying this at this price, then it's very hard to to to, to reduce the price or or increase the price uh, because it will sort of revert back, and that's what we'll see um, we'll see in a few minutes when we talk about markets in more detail. But it is important to keep in mind that. A lot of these models are just that they're models of real behavior mm -hmm. so we have to test them uh, we we you know you, you're taking your classes on quantitative methods uh, and i'm sure they will have told you that you need to 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 bring data huh? you need to bring empirical evidence for your claims huh? so economists are very good at building models and i will show you some um, but of course the, the the core business as the social science then is to think about are these actually correct so um, do people behave this way? You know, do do the models predict reality? And one of the core predictions here is is, um, is of course the concept of equilibrium prediction, and we'll see that in a few minutes. So markets then allocate resources. That's that's their purpose. It's allocating resources, and they do that based on the individual decisions of many agents. So firms on the one hand and households on the, on, the, on the other hand as they exchange goods and services. So households, consumers, decide what to buy and who to work for, and firms decide who to hire, uh, what technology to invest and what, what to produce. And markets basically aggregate all this information, all these individual decisions, um, into a market price. And under certain conditions then, a competitive market with these nice features is efficient. Um, and if a market is, if market is efficient, then there's very limited scope for government intervention into this market, not in general, you know, you can think about redistribution, etc. But there's very limited scope for government intervention into an efficient market. Okay. Um, but what do we mean by efficiency? What does it even mean, efficient? Mm -hmm. um, and what are the conditions under which a competitive market is really efficient? And when do markets fail to produce these sort of socially optimal outcomes? Mm -hmm. And is there a role for government in, in an efficient economy as well? So those are big questions. And the first one we need to answer is what, what is efficiency? What do we mean by this? What do we mean by efficiency? The concept that we'll be using a lot um, in the next few slides is the idea of Pareto efficiency. Mm -hmm. Wilfredo is back. Wilfredo Pareto is the one who invented this, this idea or, or described this concept. Okay. Um, and you'll also see what is called the utility possibilities curve, another sort of fancy word, but you'll see it's quite straightforward. Um, so what's the definition? Well, the definition is that an allocation of resources is Pareto optimal if it is not possible to reallocate resources to make at least one individual better off without making anyone worse off. Otherwise, Pareto efficiency gains can be made through reallocation. So what does it mean? Well, it means we can't, once we have allocated some resources between you know, a few people, we can't make anyone better off 
without taking something away from someone, without making someone worse off. Right? Um, that's the that's the core of the core of the concept, and you'll see an example in a second. So, how do we measure better off? What do we mean by better off? Well, we 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 think about utility. Huh? So, utility, of course, is abstract. It's how much how much we pleasure we want we derive how much how much uh, um, gain we have from from uh, from some good huh? so it's the happiness derived from goods and services and we can think about uh, about this through um, you know asking people what they what they want how much they value things or think about reveal preferences so how much people are willing to pay for certain for certain things huh? but we need to some concept of how much people want or like certain goods or services okay um, now that's all very abstract let's uh, let's look at a, at an example so let's think about an example this is the utility possibilities curve what do we mean by this well we can basically measure the utility how how much happiness we derive from some uh, allocation of resources for person one and for person two in one graph yeah? and this curve basically gives us the the sort of maximum utility that is possible between you know person one and person person two for some allocation of resources, say cookies. Okay, and basically, um, if you if you think about different allocations, different allocations are possible. So these are all possible um, possible allocations. So we have. Uh, allocations here, for example, that are not on this utility possibilities curve. That means that they are suboptimal. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that both person one and person two get something um, that they that that they maybe don't want that much, and they it would be possible to find a different allocation of resources that would make both better off, mm -hmm. uh, both for these uh, for these kind of um, uh, outcomes. And then we have an, a Pareto efficient allocation here. Which falls on the uh, utility possibilities curve. Okay, um, and we'll see an example of this in a second. Hmm. That was pretty abstract. Let's try this in a more practical worked example. And the best way to think about Pareto efficiency is cookies. So we can think about Wilfredo and me. Uh, having five cookies in a in a in a bag in a box. I'm not sure if 19th century Italians like cookies. I'm sure they do. So let's say there are five cookies in a in a box. So we can choose how to allocate these five cookies between Wilfredo and me. Um, so for example, Wilfredo can have two cookies and I can have three cookies. That's a Pareto efficient allocation of cookies. Or I can have two cookies and Wilfredo gets three cookies. That's also a Pareto efficient allocation. Or we could break a cookie in half, I guess, and everyone gets two and a half. I didn't even think about that when I made the slides. That would be the fair outcome, right? And it would be Pareto efficient. Hmm? Although I'm not sure, given the pandemic, I want to touch any cookies at the moment uh, or eat any cookies that have been touched by other people. Um, what else? So Pareto, uh, Wilfredo getting four cookies and I, me getting one cookie is also Pareto efficient. Uh, it's also very nice for Wilfredo. Um, or me getting four cookies and Wilfredo getting one cookie is a Pareto efficient allocation. Or me getting all the cookies and Wilfredo getting no cookies is a Pareto efficient allocation. Or Wilfredo the bastard getting all the cookies and poor Roland getting no cookies at all is also a Pareto efficient allocation. And it is probably Wilfredo Pareto's preferred allocation of cookies. Okay. So what are allocations that are not Pareto efficient? Um, well, any allocation that doesn't give both of us all these these five cookies really. So for example, Wilfredo getting two cookies, Roland getting two cookies, and one cookie going into the rubbish, into the bin, uh, is not a Pareto efficient allocation. Right? We've thrown away one cookie. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the that's the nature of efficiency. Yeah? So we want efficient allocations. Allocations of resources that are inefficient mm, basically mean waste. 
mean it means throwing away cookies mm -hmm. uh, and that's something we want to we want to avoid so what are the not Pareto efficient allocations well Wilfredo getting three me getting one or me getting two and Wilfredo one or both of us one cookie or both of us getting no cookies and all the cookies getting thrown away are not Pareto efficient allocations of cookies hopefully this graph is a bit clearer now um, it basically displays Wilfredo and more utility derived from the cookies. Now we've made, of course, a transfer from the cookies to utility, uh, assuming that both Wilfredo and I like, like cookies, maybe roughly in the same uh, in the same way. And the reason, so if we were to just plot the, the you know the allocation of cookies, we would get a straight line, of course, right? So either Wilfredo gets five cookies, Roland gets zero cookies, or we both get two and a half cookies somewhere here, or Roland gets five cookies and Wilfredo gets zero cookies. And we would end up with a with a straight line. But we often assume that sort of utility is um, is has diminishing marginal return. So the more cookies we eat, the less we want the next cookie. And I think that's that's not a bad bad assumption. Mm -hmm. So um, going from no cookies at all to having a cookie is pretty nice. Having another cookie is also still pretty nice. Having a third cookie, still pretty nice, but not as important as getting one or two cookies. And going from four to five cookies, or in the extreme from you know, 50 to 51 cookies, perhaps doesn't have the same sort of effect anymore. Now we maybe we get sick at some point of the cookies. Huh? So that means that rather than this being a straight line, this is sort of shaped like this in the sense that you know, both our utility um, is maximized if there's some slightly more equitable um, allocation than just sort of in the in the extreme points so, um, and that's basically the nature of this utility possibilities uh, curve hmm, uh, that shows Pareto efficient allocations of resources so we have a pretty good understanding of what Pareto efficiency means and I have claimed that markets are the tool to get us there but we don't really understand how markets work yet do we um, so how exactly does this does this work? Um, and this is um, where usually a really nice classroom experiment comes in, uh, but is unfortunately one of the, the sort of casualties of the pandemic. Um, because what it involves is when I have you all in a big lecture theater, I basically hand everyone a treat. Um, and I don't just do this to 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 make you like me, huh? but I do it to 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 run an experiment, of course. So imagine you were randomly allocated a Twix or Mars or Milky Way or Snickers or gummy bears uh, at the at the entrance, and I want you to think about how much you like, say, Twix. Okay, um, which one do you like most? Do you like Twix better than Milky Way? Do you like Snickers better than Twix? Uh, do you like gummy bears better than all of those? Um, so how would you rank order those um, those those treats? And once you've done that, you could think about sort of utility. You know? We could assign a value to this rank ordering, right? So that we say give a ten for the the thing we like most. So in my case, I out of those choices, I think I like Snickers most. So I would give Snickers a ten, and I really dislike Maltesers, so I would give Maltesers a a, a one. And you know, Mars, Twix, and, and Milky Way somewhere in between. Okay, um, so produce a rank ordering, produce sort of a utility um, function that that describes how much you like those trees. And the kicker then is like we could measure how much utility there is in total. Hmm? How you know between all of us, uh, how happy are we? And remember that this is random allocation. So while I like Snickers. Um, you know, maybe I've been given the Maltesers and I really don't like them. I'm almost indifferent between having them or not having them. Okay, um, so that's bad. So I, I don't want the Maltesers, I want the Snickers. But, and here comes the but, there might be someone in the room who likes Maltesers better than Snickers and has a Snickers and is willing to trade the Snickers with me. And that's amazing because people are different, you know. I don't understand why anyone would have this preference uh, ordering, you know, how could you not like Snickers? But some people don't like peanuts and that's okay. So people are different and that means that there's an opportunity for trades. And so if we have it randomly allocated, we can measure how much utility there's in total. What's the what's the total utility in our tiny society of, of, of 200 students or so um, with, their, with their trees? 
and then we allow trading we use the market and it's really quite easy i just shout you know go and people shout it's like a like a pit market you know, where people shout out uh, uh what what they're offering and what they what they want in exchange for it and so there's lots of trades happening lots of shouting uh, people running around shouting snickers snickers does anyone want a snickers and after a minute or two it settles why does it settle well because trades have been made so people have been made better off uh, because there was an opportunity to exchange but after a while that settles down because there's no more opportunities to to, to trade basically um, and so we arrive at a situation where no more trades can be made hmm? in other words nobody can be made better off i.e get a suite that they want more without making someone worse off giving up their suite for something they want less hmm? Um, and that's that's our outcome. And that's of course the concept of Pareto efficiency in action. Um, so there's no more no more trades are possible. Everybody has has what they have, um, and there's no way to reallocate those without taking something away from someone that they don't want to give up. Okay. Um, and we arrive there after a minute or two of trading. So it's very quick and very efficient. So the experiment basically demonstrates that markets emerge. Naturally, you don't need any specific instructions for how to run a market like that. You just run around and shout. Huh? Um, and markets emerge if they are diverse, diverse preferences. Okay. Um, and it also shows how markets can make people better off. They achieve a Pareto efficient allocation of resources, almost by definition, huh? because all the trades have been made. Um, and they are really quick and intuitive tool for achieving this. And this is kind of the the core of the core of the experiment we usually do in the in the class. So the sweets experiment is a really nice example of diverse preferences. People like different things, and if they have different sort of endowments and like different things, then there's an opportunity for um, for trade and for the emergence of a market, if you want. So think about. Um, old clothing of yours um, you may have things that you don't really like anymore that are still in good shape um, so you could sell those and there might be someone out there uh, on ebay or something um, who would really like this weird you know s sweater with the wolves on it uh, from 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 10 years ago that you that you hate huh? um, so diverse preferences lead to emergence of markets um, the other conditions um, are endowments, economies of scale and specialization. So diverse preference is often enough for markets to emerge, but there are other conditions where, where this may happen. So differences in endowments or productive resources or personal talents. Um, so think about, um, you know, staying with the sweets example, let's say somebody had uh, had bought cheaply a, a, uh, a large bucket of of uh, of snickers uh, bars or something uh, they might be willing to 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 sell them on uh, when on campus for for money or in exchange for a coffee or for help with the economics problem set or something like that okay so um so diverse endowment somebody has a lot of snickers bars they they would be happy to to trade them in reality of course we think think about more you know, more serious endowments i think about um wealth we can think about capital you know maybe somebody has a machine or can can operate a machine so thinking human capital um, or land you know things like that so differences in endowments of productive resources or personal talents huh? or maybe you're good at math and uh, and economics and uh, one of your classmates is is really good at qualitative methods so maybe you should get together and you know help each other out a little bit and explain the 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 questions or the problems okay um so diverse endowments i'm sure i'm sure you you understand the third and fourth of sort of conditions under which markets emerge spontaneously huh, um are a bit bit more complicated perhaps so um one is economies of scale so declining average costs as more output is produced now what does that mean well it basically means that once you um, invest into something, you may be uh, maybe better at producing uh, producing um, than before. So um, I always like the example of a hammer. So if you just move to London um, and you want to hang a um, a picture, 
um, you need to uh, you need to have a hammer and a nail to to sort of nail it into the into the wall. Maybe you're not allowed because of the lease. Okay, that that, that poses a problem for the example, but not for the uh, for the economic concept, of course. So you need a hammer and you need a nail. So hanging one picture is really expensive. Why? Because you don't have a hammer. It's probably not allowed on the plane. Um, or a bit heavy for your for your allowance if you if you flew here, um, and you probably also don't have a nail. Um, so what do you have to do? You have to buy a hammer and you have to buy a nail. How much is a hammer? I don't know. Five pounds, ten pounds, yeah, in a hardware store. Um, how much is a nail? Well, you can't buy a nail. You have to buy a hundred nails or something. That's how you how they get you. Know? So the cost of hanging the Hang, how much is a pack of hang, of hundred nails? I don't know, two pounds maybe or something. So the cost of hanging the first picture is what? It's five pounds for the hammer and two pounds for the hundred nails. So it's seven pounds to hang one picture. Okay. Now, what if uh, what if you want to hang a second picture? Is this the cost of the second uh, picture also five pounds? No, it's not. The marginal cost of the second picture, of course, is 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 much lower. It's the cost of the second nail. Uh, if you can buy individual nails, with free if you've bought a big uh, a big package. So the the average cost for this for this picture is much lower already. Okay. Um, so you can split the cost of the hammer and the nail uh, over the over two uh, pictures. And if you hang ten pictures, it's even cheaper. So you can once you have invested into your productive resource uh, into your into your into your capital, your hammer, your tool, uh, your machine. Uh, you can uh, you can hang many more uh, pictures, of course, and the, the individual picture gets gets cheaper and cheaper. Mm. Uh, so economies of scale, mm. um, and you can even sell this service. Huh? So instead of uh, you know every student um, you know buying a hammer and a nail, uh, you could offer your service and you could say, well, I'm 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 willing to come over to your place and hang the pictures for you, or or you can borrow the hammer and and a couple of nails for a fee. Uh, for a pound or so, and so you can make make money this way. Okay, uh, so economies of scale. Um, the fourth sort of um, um, scenario in which uh, markets sort of emerge spontaneously um, is uh, specialization. So declining average cost at the scope of action of one producer is decreased. In other words, to stick with the strange hammer example that I that I started with. Um, Maybe you want to specialize in, in hanging things for people. Maybe you want to become a handyman. Maybe you're really, really good at it. So rather than studying, you spend all your time doing all the handiwork for all your, your classmates and for, for other people. Um, and you advertise and you spend more and more time on this and less and less uh, actual um, sort of uh, learning. But you can make a lot of money, maybe. So um, you specialize in a specific, uh, specific activity and you get better at it. Huh? So the more... Uh, you work as a handyman, the better you get. Huh? So um, I do occasional small jobs in the house, but it's really, really hard for me because I never really do this. I have to look up how to do it, uh, watch a YouTube video, I have to buy a tool, um, and you know it's going to not work that well the first time around. Um, but you know if I do it another time and another time, I get better. And that's of course if you do it ten times or a hundred times, you get much, much better. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the idea of specialization. And if somebody specializes in an activity, they can, of course, sell that activity, sell that service to, uh, to, to other people. So we've seen you know, one sort of thought experiment of, of how market emerges in the presence of differences in preferences, diverse preferences. And we just walked through sort of four examples or four scenarios in which uh, markets will emerge. Huh? Uh, differences in uh, preferences, differences in endowments of productive resources, economies of scale, and uh, specialization. Okay, um, and the experiment was a nice is a nice example to 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 think about sort of how to achieve efficient allocation um, quickly and easily. And at the core of the the value of markets, the usefulness of markets is really to to think about the alternative. Um, so, for example, using a central planner. So, in the Swedes experiment, what would that entail? Well, it would entail me asking you to submit the, um, you know, your utility ordering, you know, your rank ordering of the different suites. 
and then sitting there with the back of suites that I have and looking up, uh, you know, probably with a computer algorithm because I wouldn't be able to do this by hand, uh, looking up how can I maximize the happiness of my class by giving everyone the suite they like most, subject to the constraints of the suites that I have. That's possible to do, but it is an incredibly difficult task. This would take me a day and I would have to write an, a computer algorithm to, 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 to do it. I wouldn't be able to just do it with piece of paper if we have 200 people in the class. So it's quite striking that the central planning solution to this of allocating these suites in a Pareto efficient manner is an incredibly cumbersome task, whereas the market solution, you know, just handing it out randomly and letting people trade takes minutes and leads to a to a Pareto efficient allocation. So it's uh, it's the, the difference between central planning and, and the market mechanism is quite stark in this case. And I think that's true for many uh, for many other scenarios as well. Um, and that is what what Hayek, of course, is referring to as the problem of knowledge. Huh? So knowledge is decentralized. I don't know which suite you like um, and I don't really want to know. I don't really care on some level. Mm -hmm. I want to get the optimal treat to you. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge about preferences is decentralized. The knowledge, is, knowledge about resources is decentralized. And that means in order for, for an efficient allocation mechanism to work, the decision making has to be decentralized too. Um, so decision makers in the market scenario, of course, don't need all the information about why things happen. You know, I don't need to know for everyone which suite they like. I just hand them out and you do the trading. Decentralized decision makers, agents trade amongst themselves and that is enough. I don't, nobody needs to collect all the information on individual preferences and then come up with a complicated plan for how to allocate this resource. Okay, so decentralized decision making uh, for decentralized information. So in a real market, of course, we don't use barter. Uh, we don't just trade Snickers against Twix. We use something else. We use money. Uh, we use a medium of exchange. Mm. Uh, and so that's the core here, of course. So decentralized decision makers just adapt to what? They adapt to the price level, to the prices. Uh, they adapt locally to prices. So the price mechanism is really just that. It's a it's a um, a tool for decentralized decision making and for the transmission of information among decentralized agents, among decision makers. Mm -hmm. So they prices communicate um, you know, all the relevant information we, we need. Uh, they con convey the relevant information and that is they are signals of relative scarcity. Uh, if the price of something goes up, more people will start to produce it. If the price of something goes down, few people will start to produce it or people will shift their consumption to other uh, to substitutes or 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 or, uh, or don't buy certain certain goods mm. so price is all the information we need basically mm. so decentralized decision making as in the treats experiment but using the price mechanism um, and the medium of exchange of money uh, to transfer this information is enough. Um, so we don't need to to know everyone's utility from 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 tweets or whatever it is. So we're almost there. So markets basically emerge spontaneously and they use information. They use prices, the the value of a good in whatever medium of exchange we use. Um, it's the only signal that we need. It's a signal of scarcity and valuation. And Hayek, of course, is uh, you know is writing in the, again against socialism in you know 1945 uh, on, in the use of knowledge in society. Uh, so he's selling his uh, his goods a little bit maybe, but it is um, you know it is a deep insight. And he writes, I am convinced that if it were the result of deliberate human design. This mechanism, the price mechanism, the market, would have been acclaimed as one of the greatest triumphs of the human mind. You can disagree with the with the with the, with the phrasing, um, but markets are an incredibly powerful tool, uh, and it is a tool. There are tools that we that we use naturally. Markets emerge spontaneously. We all know what to do. Uh, it doesn't require 
um, you know, or any any specific setting it up or something. Um, so they are a powerful tool like any other tool, really. And that's the way to think about prices. So prices are aggre information aggregation mechanisms. And prices are not, a, information is not the only thing though, of course, that goes into it. The, the, the markets just based on prices doesn't work, so we need incentives. Huh? We, need, we need people to respond to it. Huh? So people choose not to buy something or to buy more of something or to produce something huh? or produce more of it. Um, and that's the insight of Adam Smith, of course, in The Wealth of Nations. And Adam Smith writes, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Uh, this is the, uh, the the core insight of Adam Smith, of course, that, that the allocation, as if by an invisible hand, uh, this is uh, Smith's terminology, um, we get an um, efficient allocation of, of resources, and that is basically based on self-interest. You know, we don't need to have a benevolent social planner that takes all the information on the treat preferences and then does what is right or what is what it, what they are elected to do or whatever it is. No, we just rely on individual self-interest. So you want a Snickers, you don't like the gummy bears, so just trout and and you will you will find someone to to trade with. Huh? So information aggregation through prices and the incentives uh, that that markets create to 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 sell and produce uh, goods are at the core of what markets really do. And the outcome that we get out of this, um, if certain conditions hold, and we'll explore these in much more detail, of course, over the course of this of this um, module, uh, what we get then is a Pareto efficient allocation of uh, of resources as the outcome. And specifically, we get Pareto efficient allocation uh, of consumption choices and productive resources. So consumption choices is really gains from trade. This is what we just sort of thought about in, in our market experiment. Hmm? Uh, so we can make everyone better off without inc an increase in goods, huh? just by, by allocating things optimally between, between people. But we also get Pareto efficient allocation of productive resources through economies of scale and specialization. Um, and specialization, and both of these basically lead to an increase in consumption possibilities. So if people you are know, thinking about the hammer and the painting hanging example, uh, if we have one person that um, that has the hammer and the nails and is going around hanging all our pictures, then we don't need to individually all buy hammers, invest into hammers. Uh, this is a much more efficient system, uh, of course, to uh, to achieve this uh, achieve this goal. Um, and also specialization. So having a, an actual handyman do the work rather than you sort of uh, as an amateur doing it, um, of course, makes uh, makes uh, makes all our lives better as well, because you can spend time on 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 learning economics or whatever, whatever it is you want to do when someone else is hanging the pictures for you. And that means we can uh, we can produce more with the same resources huh? uh, or with fewer resources. Huh? And that's, of course, the potential for everyone to be. Uh, to be better off. Now, in the lecture, I would normally pause at this point, and there would be some grumbling, uh, and people would say, "Ah, markets, uh, but what about fairness? What about equality? Um, what about uh, if you don't have the money to buy certain things?" And you're right. Uh, Fairness and equality are different considerations from efficiency, and we will spend time on 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 those. Yeah. But it is a different question. It requires a normative standards, mm -hmm. normative standards. So what do we as a society or as individuals think is fair? What do we think is uh, is the right thing uh, to do or the right way to, to, uh, to redistribute or to alleviate poverty? Mm -hmm. And these are big and important questions, but they are, of course, questions that require normative standard. Markets are not the mechanism for that. Markets will not give you that. Markets are for allocating resources. Uh, they are a tool. Mm -hmm. uh, they are neutral in that way. They are a tool like language or money or, or any kind of technology. Okay, uh, so we shouldn't expect markets to to perform this uh, this um, uh, this 
the service of creating equality you know? and it's actually kind of a perversion that some people seem to think that sort of a market driven allocation is inherently right or good or or or, or desirable that's crazy you know? uh, markets are a tool for allocating resources and a very good tool at that and that's what we should treat them as a tool that 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 can be left unchecked and work in certain circumstances and that we want to set up in other circumstances thinking about you know cap and trade climate type uh, climate um, change um, uh, mitigation etc so we might set it up in certain circumstances we might forbid it under other circumstances thinking about things that we don't want to get traded like drugs or guns or or, or people um, but sort of expecting markets to produce normatively desirable outcomes in terms of equality is crazy. Huh? It's not, that's not what they're there for. They are there for allocating, allocating resources uh, in an efficient manner. It is also important, I think, to think, uh, to, to note that allocation obviously doesn't just happen based on preference huh? and desire and need alone. So it's not just that you like Snickers bars, that you get a Snickers bar, you obviously need to have the money, the income or wealth to, to, to pay for it in a real market. Huh? But of course, this is something that we can address through redistribution. And I think most economists actually agree that we should uh, use redistribution of resources um, to, um, to make sure that everybody can um, you know, can, can can purchase certain things, and that that uh, that we alleviate poverty or create more equal equal societies. That's something that probably most economists will actually agree with. But markets are a very good tool at allocating some of the goods and services that we that we want to consume. And market-based allocation is usually preferable uh, to some other allocation mechanisms. So, what are other allocation mechanisms? For example, queuing. Uh, so we've all done it. We've all had to stand in line and wait for something. But queuing is just a really s sort of silly market mechanism, if you want, in a way, because it's in the end, while while of course everybody who queues at least up to some point uh, will will get whatever they are standing in line for, um, it's basically just using another currency uh, rather than paying more in order to to get the the. You know, the theater tickets or whatever it is uh, directly uh, you pay with your time so if i want to see you know if i want to see um you know a tennis match in wimbledon i can either queue or i can uh, i can pay or well, there's a different mechanism of course but the queuing is basically i pay for the ticket with my time uh, so i have to get up super early in the morning and stand at three in the morning uh, in wimbledon queuing for 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 a tennis match that's just a different currency than, than money. So it would be much easier for many people if you could just pay additional money in order to um, to, to get the ticket. Um, and if you think about ticket touting or think about people who pay other people to stand in line for them, we immediately get these kinds of secondary markets. Huh? So there's uh, some people that, that, that queue for trainers, huh? for, 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 for um, uh, for sneakers. Mm -hmm. uh, so fancy sneakers come out uh, and a limited edition and some people want them. But of course, you know, not everybody wants to stand in line for days in, in, a, in, in a downtown New York or London shop. Um, so they pay other people to stand in line for them. You know, so you immediately get a secondary market because queuing is just a, a market by other means. What other allocations to, can we use? Well, sometimes we want chance. Sometimes we want lotteries. So, for example, um, you know, the American uh, military or the American society decided who had to go to Vietnam, at least in part, based on a lottery, uh, because it is, of course, a huge imposition and very dangerous to be sent to war. And so it, uh, that was one of the mechanisms to, to, to create a fair allocation. OK, that's an alternative uh way to do this so a lottery but for many goods we wouldn't want that so we wouldn't want our our sweets to to be allocated using a lottery of course it's crazy um and markets are also preferable to at least in many uh circumstances to sort of what what we can call authoritative allocation or government allocation public allocation and the reason for this is basically twofold so one is the information reason that i've just 
that I've just uh, that we've just worked through uh, in terms of Hayek. So it's really really hard for the government to know what people really need. So yes, we can design public services, for example, um, but it is not so easy to know what demand looks like and how we should price them if we if we if we price them or how much we should invest into them. So it's really really hard to actually do this in practice. And the other reason uh, is of course corruption. Um, while this is perhaps less of a problem um, in the UK or in other um, you know modern developed sort of economies with with a, with a sort of strong rule of law, corruption is happening in many places. Um, and in many countries, you know, the government being able to allocate resources leads to immediately leads to corruption. So if you're a local bureaucrat and you um, can give out permits for something, you of course can see this immediately as a money making opportunity, and people have to bribe you in order to do, to get their uh, to get their driver's license or, or whatever whatever the government is is uh, is offering.